This is the Pebble Corsi Block Tapping Task. Uh, there's another video that's about a minute long that shows the Corsi Blocks in action, but this one is going to be probably 10 or 15 minutes long and describe a, a lot about how the task works, how you can uh, adapt it or change it, some of the parameters you can set, and how to look at the data and make sense of the data. So the <laughs> Corsi Block Tapping Task is a visual short-term memory task. You're shown a sequence of, of squares from this, um, usually from this layout, and it, each square is highlighted in sequence with a sort of yellowish um, color, and then you have to reproduce that color. Um, the Corsi block task is one of the most commonly used uh, of the Pebble tasks within other uh, research groups and other papers. If you do a search for Pebble Corsi Block on Google Scholar, you get <coughs> around 100 hits. I don't think all of these are ones that actually use the Pebble version, but sometimes people use uh, another version, like a physical version of it, along with some other Pebble task and things like that. So, th But there are a lot of papers that have used the Pebble Corsi task and established, you know, its sensitivity and its specificity for a lot of different um, interventions and differences among people. Um, so, so the Corsi task itself dates back to a physical version implemented in the 70s, first published by P.M. Corsi uh, in, a, in a dissertation and. Uh, um, and maybe uh, in 2000, Kessels did a very nice paper uh, get collecting normative data and coming up with a standardization. So um, coming up with a standard layout for the, for the blocks and a standard problem, set of problems. So you, you don't have just random problems. There's also a standard backward version um, that Kessels also published in uh, uh, 2008. And the problems they published um, are ones that are available within Pebble. You can use those, or you can use random ones. Um, it's uh, you can just use completely random ones, and um, you can also ha use the standard Corsi layout of blocks, or you can use random fi configuration as well. Um, the original Corsi task actually used blocks, 3D blocks, on a on a tabletop, and I think they use blocks because you can sort of write the numbers on one side without the person seeing it. So they were three-dimensional, so that you could um, the experimenter could be sitting, I guess, over here, the subject over here, and on the back of these would be written the numbers, so they can easily figure out if you are um, if you get it right. So um, before we begin uh, looking at what the task looks like, let's um, consider some of the parameter options you can choose. So if I select Corsi from um, within the launcher under Battery Corsi, I can hit Edit for parameters, and here's a number of the parameters. So um, by default, there'll be a short number of practice problems just to get them oriented. If you're doing this multiple times, you can probably get rid of the practice. <coughs> um, a common variation of the Corsi block task is a backward Corsi block. And so you see a sequence, then you have to reproduce it backward. Um, we address this by allowing you to change the direction from one to negative one for forward versus backward. Um, here, this asks whether you should use um, a block location identical to Corsi's. And this is sort of the standard that you use those specific configurations. I suspect that if you were training someone to do this task many, many times, they might sort of um, be able to enumerate these and um, learn the spatial configuration or something. So there's probably some reason why you might want to use a random configuration. This allows you to, but hardly everyone, hardly anyone ever does that. Um, it's hard enough with using the standard configuration. This asks whether you should use Kessel's points, um, the, the Kessel's problems, the problem set that Kessel described. And this is the, probably the most common thing when um, 
And you have to be a little careful if you're using random problems because um, th some problems might be slightly easier than others. And Kessels are normed and they're developed to be sort of equally difficult. Um, if you're not using Kessels, it will use this configuration. It'll start with two, and it'll go up to nine. Um, and I think it stops once you get one wrong. The, uh, this is sort of like memory span, where you have to get everything right, and um, you have to get at least one right per length to go on to the next length. If you're not getting it right, you you stop. I don't think there's, <coughs> I don't think I have a way of um, doing it, even if you get them wrong. Um, like we have in the Pebble memory span task. Um, but this will go from 2 up to 9, twice per length by default, and you have to get at least one right. You could increase that if you want maybe greater reliability. But um, this will only use these if you don't use the Kessels. The Kessels will use the default Kessel problems. Uh, you can see how long um, you want to pause between trials and between stimuli. One second is sort of common. And then there's a, a question of whether you should use this beep. Um, we'll turn the beep on. And so on each, I think it's actually response, not stimulus. There's a beep that indicates you made a response. Um, so those are some of the configurations. Uh, let's try to just um, We'll turn Kessels off to see um, how that works. And I'll save this and we'll use that um, that parameter set. Uh, so I'll do full screen so we can see it, how it will expand to the screen size. And we're using participant, we'll use participant 50. Okay. Oh, this, there we go. Uh, you'll first pr perform three practice trials to become familiar with the test. They will not affect your score. Okay. You can, I think you can probably hear the beeps that happen here. Um, the beeps are sort of to give feedback, especially if you're doing uh, if you're doing uh, touch screen responses, sometimes it's nice to have that to let them know that their touch on the screen is sort of registered. Okay, now we're going to do normal trials. These will count towards your score. Okay. We start with length two, and you know everyone probably will get length two right. And also length three is really easy to get right. As you start getting longer, um, it gets more difficult. Or possibly you could have an, a dual task situation, or you could study patients where um, these short ones might even cause problems. And you can see I'm doing two per length. And this is length four. Let's say I get this one wrong. Um, is it correct? One thing to note here is that the subject has to tell um, that they're done. So just because it was five, doesn't mean it's going to automatically um, stop when I finish the trial. You also can't back up. It, you can't undo things. Um, so I'm going to get both of these wrong so we don't have to go any further. Um, and maybe I'll do this. So I had two wrong. It tells me the block span is four. That was the longest uh, length that I got at least one right. Uh, however, I did get some, only one right at length four, so this is sort of a adjusted memory span that counts for that. This is a total score where I get points for every one I got correct. And you could use 
um, any of these really as measures of memory to compare to other people or compare the um, to other conditions. Okay, so that's the basic task. And uh, we could also do backward. And so uh, what I've done is I've created a, if you, you know, edit these, you could change one to backward. And so I've created one that already works backward. I guess I misspelled it and called it backward I, but the direction is negative one here. And I've fixed other parameters here. So um, once you have a different parameter set, you could switch between the forward and backward. Um, and another thing you can try is putting them in an experiment chain. So I call this one, you know, so if, let me clear this chain. And so if I want, say, a forward, I select the, the forward version and I can insert or append onto the chain. And then I can change the parameter setting to backward and append as well. Um, and maybe I want to change this backward just to let me know what's going on and then I can save this. Now whenever I bring up this um, config file I can run, run the chain instead of running through here and it will do both forward and backward. <coughs> um, I don't want to run through that whole thing so let's just try see what it looks like if we run it backwards. So I've got the backward set here I won't do it full screen this time. Um, and you can see we used a random, a random layout. So this is very different than the Kessel's layout. It just sort of chooses them randomly. Oh, and I have to remember to do this backward. Okay. Okay, that was correct. And those were the practice trials. Now they're the ones that count. And it uses a new layout now. And in fact, I think it uses a new layout on every single trial. This is only because I set that parameter in the um, that parameter with, within the parameter setting to not use the standard layout. Um, I suspect no one's actually ever compared to see if this makes a difference. And you can see that if you're trying to play along, the backward really isn't that much more difficult than the forward. Um, it's maybe surprising that it isn't, but I think part of it is, unlike, um, it probably is a little harder, but unlike normal digit span where you have to sort of reverse the sequence, you have the, sequ the visualization of the path um, sort of that you follow. I don't think I got that one right. Um, and you can just sort of replay it backward, I think a lot more easily than you can replay um, a sequence a backward if it were digit span sequence. Okay, I probably got one more trial to do. Okay, so <coughs> block span five, total correct, total correct trials, memory span 4.5, and so on. Um, Okay, so let's say that you've completed this. You want to know what the um, how to look at the data. I can open up the data folder here, and there's actually a number of data files that are saved. Um, first, there's a log file that's saved that tells you um, different points in the trial log to this file. So I was just using 50 and 51 here. And I can see when the whole thing started, when the practice trials started, when the regular trials started, when the regular trials ended. Um, 
this can sometimes help if you lose data or lose a data file or something crashes halfway between you can identify where it was or and things like that um, there's also a summary which will pool all of your subjects together and so I did both forward and backward here so I have a forward and backward summary file there's two of them uh, so let's look at this one will be the forward pooled and there's you know three or four different participants here practice test practice test this is one subject and they're all put into the same file uh, so that you could then uh, bring it into R or SPSS very easily you get um, one row per trial you see when it starts its length what the stimulus was what the response was uh, it gives a partial correct score so how many did you get correct it gives a partial miss and whether you got it all correct the all correct is what really matters and the time required time taken but there's also let's see forward pooled sum which gives I think one line per person so maybe you don't care about all of those detailed um, trial by trial recordings but you want the memory span and this will just record you know forward memory span and, and these measures for each person one line per person uh, similar are similar files are available for backward um, that's more of a convenience all of that same data is going to be stored within the fo subject folder so if we look at this there's going to be uh, three files here one is this detail file and this is actually on a click by click basis so you can see if you look at trial num we have two rows for trial one two I'm sorry two rows for trial one two rows for trial two three for th trial three which was um, link three and so on so every click you make um, is recorded here and the XY coordinates of the thing you clicked on are recorded as well um, so that's the most detailed one if you want to do more careful error analysis there's also a trial by trial version which just records sort of like in that summary file um, the, the given sequence and the respondent sequence whether they got it correct and how many they got correct and then there's a summary file which is basically the um, thing people see at the end this should probably be saved as a text file rather than a CSV file but it sort of gives the report of what's going on so that's what the data look like and the only thing left is to th talk about translations so if you want to change the text you can select this and go to translate test and here's the different um, here's a different language or instructions that you could adapt if you want to um, translate it you can select a new language code here and then um, do all the translations to your second language in here um, and you just have to make sure you uh, translate each of these and if you do that please send me the file after you're done uh, also translate even if you're only using forward translate the backward and send it because some people uh, it would be great if we could have backward translations for all the new languages um, the translations would are just saved within your folder with um, the Corsi folder under translations and so right now we have English Spanish Hungarian I'm not sure what KR is and this is either Lithuanian or Italian Portuguese Swedish KRs uh, it looks like it's Korean <coughs> um, so we have a bunch of translations but um, certainly could use more all right well that is the pebble uh, a complete description of the pebble Corsi block test and uh, it's downloadable within the pebble system and as part of the pebble test battery uh, you can get it at pebble.sourceforge.net thank you